Okay, I think we'll we'll get started now. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance uh, for my air conditioner. It's very loud. It's like, I don't know, 30 degrees in my house right now. <laughs> it's very warm, so it's a necessity. Um, I think I need to introduce myself to give myself some credibility. So my name is Chris, and I'm, uh, you know, an eye guide guru. I've heard people call me that. Uh, and I was a real estate photographer um, for many years, and I've shot thousands of houses. Um, so I have some experience uh, with different types of gear and different methods. And the goal of today is to communicate some of the, you know, the basics, uh, basically, to you so that you don't make any mistakes. So if you've just started doing real estate photography, there's a lot of, you know, little tips that you can get out of this. And they're all um, uh, contained within a blog post that I wrote, uh, which I'm going to load up in like two seconds, and we're going to go through. Um, and the goal of this is to, is to just sort of move you um, forward enough that you can skip all those mistakes. Um, you can make different ones. That'll be fun. Uh, so I'm going to talk for around 30 minutes or so. Um, after 30 minutes, I'm going to go uh, through the chat and look for questions. So if you if you have questions, write them in the chat, and then I'll go through it, you know, after I'm done talking or add them uh, later. I might answer them, so you might not need to put them in at all. And um, what I'm going to do now is quickly load up a web page. So you guys can see the same web page. It was in the email um, that was sent to you, and it is uh, a blog post on goiguide.com under um, media. So to find all our blog posts, you go to goiguide.com, which I hope you guys can see, and you click media at the top, and what you'll see is that there's all sorts of blog posts here, but they're categorized. So, you know, if you just want ones that relate to um, real estate news or, in our case, photography, you click the little blue bar, and it will sort them all. Oh, there's me, in case you want to know what I look like, that guy holding the bag right there. <laughs> um, so I wrote this blog ages ago, so it's going to be a few pages um, back. So let's find it. There it is. Come on, there we go. All right, 10 ways to distinguish professional real estate photography. So I'm gonna walk you through this and I'm going to talk about not only shooting, but post-processing. So again, the goal is to like, you know, show you the, the almost the minimum requirements for real estate photography in order to sort of keep yourself out of trouble, if that makes any sense. Um, all right, number one, I'm just diving right in here. Make sure your horizon line is level. So what this means, and this is a big one, it just literally means level your camera. So a big mistake that people make when they first start is that they try to shoot um, with the camera pointing, you know, sort of up or pointing down or tilted left or tilted right. So if your camera's not level, that means that you can create some really, really upsetting images. <laughs> So I want you to look on the screen right now. So there's an example on the left and an example on the right. So the example on the left is it's crooked, right? It's kind of tilted to one side. So leveling the camera fixes this. Leveling your camera takes, I don't know, five seconds. Um, so the easiest way to do that is to buy a spirit level and put it on the hot shoe of your camera. Some tripods have built-in spirit levels. Um, so you can use that. Some cameras themselves have built-in leveling systems. Most do, I suppose, at this point. It uh, doesn't matter how you do it, but if you level your camera, you're going to get a far more pleasant image than if you didn't. So this would be called in post rotation. So if you wanted to, you could fix this in post, uh, but that's extra work you don't need to do. If you just shoot it right, right from the beginning, that means that um, you won't have to rotate it later. It'll just be, you know, essentially done. And um, there is indeed, I'm going to answer a question from the chat right now, there is indeed a level right on the IMS-5. And if you need to steal it, you totally can. It's just a little tiny one in the hot shoe. They work great. They're not super duper accurate. You know, they're a few degrees off here or there, but it's fine. It'll get the job done. Leveling your camera is good for everything. Anything you do in life, <laughs> level your camera. When you're shooting real estate, when you're shooting video, when you're shooting your kids, always level your camera. Um, it'll save you a lot of work later, and it creates a much more professional 
uh, looking product in general. Um, so this, the blog post just mentions what I just said, which is that you can level your camera on site and level in post. The benefit of doing it on site, leveling the camera itself, is that later in post, when you rotate, you're basically going to be missing image date on the edges of the frame, so you'll have to crop in. You'll have to try it, and you'll know what I'm talking about, but you're not taking full advantage of your wide-angle lens if you have to rotate later when you get to post. Uh, either way, number two. So this is the big one. I probably should have started with this one, but you, you kind of need to know to level your camera uh, before you can do this next one, because this helps a lot with this. So I'm going to say something semi-controversial. The only thing that really separates conclusively very amateur photography from very professional real estate photography is um, the approach to vertical lines in the image. So what I mean by vertical lines is, here, I'll pick this one, is any line that is vertical in the image. So that's typically, you know, window frames or door frames or the edges or intersections of walls, or in here, in this case, glass. Anything that is a vertical line should be perfectly straight up and down. So if you're going to focus on one thing <laughs> from today's webinar, you're just going to do one thing, especially as a beginner. If you want to just be, a, you know, be recognized as a professional real estate photographer, just do this, you'll be fine. Everything else is obviously important, but this is the most important thing on the whole list. Um, now, the easiest way to get perfect vertical lines when you're shooting is to level your camera. So if you level your camera, all the lines will be pretty close. They're not going to be perfect, but going to be very close. So I'm going to show you an example. I hope this comes across on the video. Um, if your camera is level, all the lines should be straight. But if the camera is pointing down a little bit, the lines, the vertical lines, are going to converge toward the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to mention this probably throughout the, the webinar here. I'm going to talk about converging vertical lines on occasion. So converging means that if you were to extend those vertical lines down below the bottom of the frame, eventually they would you know, converge or intersect. Um, now the opposite of this would be this example. So in this case, the camera's angled um, up a little bit. So what that does is it um, basically takes the lines and makes them converge toward the top of the screen. So either of these two, you know, converging toward the top or converging toward the bottom are undesirable. You want your photos to appear to be perfectly level. So that's all the vertical lines straight up and down. Um, now to that point, someone's going to ask, I'm sure, should we be worried about horizontal lines? And you can see in this image, it, I captured it in a very grid-like way so that all of the horizontal lines would also be um, perfectly horizontal. So that's a lot of extra work. Um, so, and you certainly don't have to do that. Um, we'll get to sort of basic um, angles later, but uh, it is an option. You can do that if you want. Um, like I said, I'll address that in a minute. So yes, you can do it, but you don't really have to. All right, cool. Number two, correct your vertical lines. Like I said, this is the most important thing in this whole this whole blog post. <laughs> um, I didn't mention this, but you can fix uh, you can fix this in post. So all almost everything on this list is going to be set up this way. It's like you can fix it when you're shooting, or you can fix it in post, or there's a sort of a combination of the two. And this is a great example. If you were to shoot, let's go back to our example here, um, with your camera and it's not level, it's angled slightly down, you're going to have converging verticals. So you don't need to panic when you get back to your computer. What you can do is you can use um, what's called the vertical transform tool in Photoshop or Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw or whatever software you prefer. And vertical transformation is just a fancy way of saying pinch the bottom of the image or the top of the image in a very particular way. So you can see here that these um, lines are further apart at the top than they are at the bottom. So if you were to pinch the top of the image, like squish it, you would basically push those lines so that they were vertical. Um, and it's often very hard to get your vertical lines to be perfect, even if you level your camera. Um, you know, your level might not be perfect. Um, your camera's weight might um, also be a problem. Sometimes lenses stick out really far and they kind of sag. So you might try your best to level the camera. You might really struggle with it. Either way, often it's a combination of the two. You level on site to try to get the vertical lines as straight as possible. And then when you, you know, later bring it into something like Photoshop, then you fine tune it a little bit. And um, I will do a whole 
separate webinar on just Photoshop if there's enough desire. So, um, you know, put it in the chat or say it on the forum or whatever. But if you guys want something about just Photoshop editing, um, we can do that. And it, it's Photoshop and Lightroom are like really the same thing under the hood. So um, it applies to both if you're using Lightroom. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go down to the number three. All right, achieve even exposure. So if you've been on the internet at all, <laughs> or you've been on any photography forums, you're gonna see that this is kind of the thing that people talk about most. This is what everybody is constantly obsessed with, is um, exposure, but they don't call it exposure. What they call it is, you know, um, flambient or HDR or um, shooting in raw or whatever. So there's a lot of chitter chatter about how to achieve certain exposure levels. So typically, so I'm gonna show you this example here. So typically what you have in, in almost every image is you have really, really bright areas and really, really dark areas. So the bright areas we're gonna call highlights, the dark areas we're gonna call shadows, and then there's lots of stuff in between. So cameras are terrible at capturing both shadows and highlights at the same time and making them look like even. So there are a zillion tricks to getting them, um, the highlights to be darker. So getting the, the you know, sort of the windows, mostly windows, um, but also light fixtures to be sort of a little bit darker and getting shadows, things like cupboards and furniture or whatever to be lighter. So that when you look at an image, it looks more like this example. So in this example, you can see very clearly out the window, all the cupboards and all the details and all of the those dark areas before are all really obvious. Um, but in this photo, you can see that, that you can barely see through the window and a lot of the details are obscured. So achieving this can be done in any way you want, whatever way you like. And there are a zillion different ways um, of achieving this. And so I'm gonna walk you through probably, uh, I'm gonna say the three most common ways. And I, I think I already mentioned them. It was HDR, um, shooting in RAW, and then adding flash or adding light. So the easiest way to do this is to, um, shoot in HDR. So the reason it's the easiest way is that HDR, when shot, has a really, really large dynamic range. That means it's really good at capturing those details that we talked about in the highlights and in the shadows. Um, and it's very simple, relatively simple to use and can be automated over a, a large amount of photos. It can also sometimes be in camera. So for example, I have a Nikon D750. I think it has built-in HDR. Um, I think it might be terrible. I don't really remember. I don't use it. But um, so that's an option too. So you might go with a hardware solution. The iGUIDE camera, for example, does HDR. It's very good. Uh, it's been tuned um, to be excellent and does a very good job. Um, but HDR is typically done in bulk anyway, in software. So that means you would shoot um, your images on site and then you would later bring them home and you would load them into something that does HDR. There's photo, photomatics and um, yeah, well, Photoshop will do it as well and so will Lightroom. And basically, the way, what HDR is, is it's a series of images. So usually it's three, but it can be more. And you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when the you hear the eye guide camera work, because you can hear it clicking away. It's taking multiple images. Those multiple images are merged. So the purpose of those multiple images is to have one dark image, one light image, and one in the middle. And when you smush them all together or fuse them together, you're going to be able to see, you know, in the really bright image, you'll be able to see the details in the cupboards. In the really dark image, you'll be able to see the details in the windows or highlights. And in the middle image, you'll kind of see everything else. So the way you get around this, this, this you know, sort of limitation of cameras is that you just take more pictures and then you take, you know, them and smush them together and take the good parts from each and you get, you know, a composite, something that's, you know, made of multiple parts. So the reason HDR, HDR is probably the most popular way of doing this because it's like I said, it's easy, it's automated. Um, you can get very consistent results. Uh, it has its flaws. HDR often has issues with things like haloing and um, it'll have problems around the edges of bright light sources. Um, and often you won't get a look that you really want. Sometimes it sends the colors to a really weird, strange place of nightmare fuel. But um, you also have less to work with in terms of um, sort of image data. And this will lead into the next way of sort of shooting. But um, when you're shooting HDR, you're typically shooting in JPEG 
And so those JPEGs have a limited amount of sort of wiggle room in terms of image data. So that means if there are white balance issues, they're a bit harder to fix. But that is not the case in the second method, which I'm going to tell you about. Did I list all these? Yeah, I did. I did them out of order though, sorry. So the next one is shooting in RAW. So when I used to shoot all the time, this is what I did. And what I would do is I would shoot a single exposure. And then when I bring that one image, so it's faster than HDR in the sense that you don't need to shoot multiple pictures, you shoot one. In some cases, two. We'll get to that. When you shoot one image, then you bring it into your post-processing software of choice, and you artificially brighten up the, um, the shadowy areas and darken down the highlight areas. So this is extremely effective depending on the camera system that you're using. <laughs> so cameras are really good. In general, pretty much all cameras are good at capturing detail in shadows, and they're absolutely terrible at doing it in highlights by comparison. So what that means is that if you shoot an image and it's got really dark cabinets, you can artificially darken or lighten up those cabinets and they'll be okay. They'll look pretty good. But if you artificially darken down the windows, they'll look awful. Um, so typically when you shoot in RAW, you've got a lot more wiggle room. And what you can do is you can make your images slightly darker than they normally would be so that when you, you retain some of the detail in the highlights, like they're already darker, so that when you boost the shadows, you can make them match. Um, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing impossible about shooting multiple raw images as well and then using those for HDR. So that's a combination of the two things we just mentioned. Um, but then you're, you're, you know, you're working with a lot of data. So a typical JPEG depends on the resolution of the camera, but it's going to be, I don't know, five to 10 megabytes. Raw files tend to be much bigger, 20 to 40 megabytes, again, depending on the resolution of your camera. So shooting multiple raw images is much more challenging just in terms of the quantity of data that you're capturing. Um, than shooting HDR in JPEG. Either way, um, I used to shoot RAW all the time uh, because I had a special trick. So I'm going to tell you what it was. It's kind of cool. I don't know. I've never heard of anyone else ever doing this, so it's probably really weird. What I would do is I would shoot in RAW, and I would shoot an image, and then I would just look at it on the back of my camera, and I would think about it, and I'd think, is this good enough? And most of the time, it was fine. Um, I didn't really need to retain a lot of highlight data for the most part because most windows... Um, whatever was on the other side of them was ugly. It was like a brick wall or like, you know, or nothing, <laughs> another house or whatever. So retaining the highlights for the majority of images wasn't even that important. Um, but every so often I would have something where the highlights were critical. So that's very common when you have something outside the window that's, you know, quite attractive, like a view. Maybe there's a lake or a mountain or some beautiful trees or something. So in that scenario, what I would do is I would shoot one raw exposure and then I would shoot a second one, but I would switch my camera to highlight metering mode. So if you switch to highlight meter, metering mode, what your camera does is it, is it decides, it automatically decides what exposure to use, but it prioritizes the highlights. So what would happen is that I would get a much, much darker exposure. So I'd have my original one, which was just kind of normal, and then I'd have my, my second one, which was quite dark. And then later in post, what I would do is something called masking. So I can't show you that here, it's too complicated. But at the same time, it's not that complicated. It's pretty easy. Um, but what I would do is I would mask in the windows so that I have a, a you know a really really nice looking interior and then a really really sharp looking exterior. And when you see windows in uh, really fancy magazines or when people show off their work online and they're really proud of it, like 99 times out of 100, they've masked in the windows. That's how you get the absolute best results. It's better than just shooting a single raw image. It's better than HDR. And in some, but not all cases, it kind of depends. It's better than using a flash. But you can combine it with flash as well if you want. OK, so recap. Shooting HDR um, is fast and it's easy and can be automated. Shooting, uh, but it still requires you to take a bunch of images. Shooting in RAW um, is similarly fast, requires less images, but requires you to kind of use your brain and sort of um, make sure that you're getting what it is that you need in post. So you're, you know, you're boosting those shadows and dropping those highlights in post. Um, and then the last, the last thing, and I, I know it'll probably come up in the questions, is adding flash. So if you are a beginner and you've just started doing real estate photography, don't worry about flash. Just skip it for now. It's, it's very time consuming and there's nothing wrong with going that route later because you can do some pretty cool stuff. But the basics of just getting your verticals straight and making sure your camera's level and just really coming to grips with your gear and learning how to um, modify your exposure and do a few other things to get what you want is way, way, way more important. <laughs> as long as you can achieve an even looking exposure, 
you can you can get Flash down the road. Uh, there's like whole forums or, or Facebook groups or whatever just devoted to this Flash stuff, and that's cool. It's nothing wrong with that. It's fun, um, but you don't really need it. Not right away, anyway. So that's my my hot take on that is um, skip Flash if you're a beginner. Get into it later. Um, just wait on that. All right, cool. So the next thing, white balance and color. So this is one area where raw images really shine. So they've got a lot more wiggle room in terms of um, sort of picking uh, a white balance because you can change it after the fact. You have almost limitless control. So if you're shooting HDR, you don't have as much control. You're really relying on um, the camera or your own eye to guess on site. And then you've got a little bit of wiggle room later. So just so we're all on the same page, um, you've got, we're going to use two words, warm and cool. So cool means like bluish, and warm means yellowish, and balanced means something in the middle, right? So we don't want something that's too cool, and we don't want something that's too warm. We want something that looks relatively normal. It's actually more complicated than that. There's also tints, which is like the magenta green thing, but don't worry about that for now. Um, when you are setting up your camera, you can set the white balance to um, auto select whatever you want. Like you can set select a preset. So often cameras will have multiple versions of auto because there is no one right answer for white balance. It's a lot of, it's subjective. It's a lot of personal preference. So some people really like something that's very warm and some people like images that are very cool. So I would encourage you to, to always choose a balanced approach um, or err on the side of too warm most of the time. Um, that seems to be the popular choice. Every camera brand is a little different too. So Canon tends to be a little warmer than Nikon as well. So you might have multiple auto modes um, in, for example, Nikon, like auto to warm or something, um, which will kind of push it a little more to the warm side. Um, either way, if you set it up in camera, and you're shooting in JPEG, you need to make sure what you've got is good enough <laughs> before you leave the property. If you're shooting in RAW, you don't really have to worry about it um, so much. You can fix it later. Adjusting and post-processing can be done in multiple ways. So there are, there are, I won't you know go too deep into it, but often you um, adjust the white balance by selecting something in the image that's white. So there are lots of tricks to doing this, but um, the easiest one is to use what's called an eyedropper tool and white balance in post by clicking on something that's white. And the iGUIDE camera has this too. It's built right into Stitch. Some people don't ever know it's there, but if you hover your mouse cursor over the image, it's an eyedropper. And whatever you click on, you're basically telling the software, hey, software, this is supposed to be white. And it adjusts the whole image um, to, to make that white and it adjusts all the colors accordingly. Uh, Photoshop, Adobe Camera Raw, Lightroom, they all have this built in. It's very good. Um, this doesn't really address the question of different white balances. Uh, I can't remember if that occurs later in the article. No, I'll just dive right in now. So what you can have happen is uh, you can have different white balances in the same, um, oh, sorry, different white balance requirements, I should say, in the same image. So the most common reason that happens is that you'll have really warm interior lights and really cool exterior light. So there are a zillion tricks to, um, you know, sort of getting them to be even. So I'll tell you a couple just for fun. So um, when you have this happen, you're going to notice that typically you're going to choose a white balance that's suitable for the interior. So you're going to set your white balance um, presets or whatever so that the interior looks normal. And then you're going to get this horrendous bluish cast <laughs> coming through the windows. The one really simple trick in Photoshop or Camera Raw or Lightroom is to do something called desaturating the blue channel. So you can go into your colors. This is my hot tip for today. Go into the color settings, um, and you can even do this in the Stitch program as well. And basically, um, go to Hue Saturation, select the blue channel only, and then desaturate it completely. And what that will do is remove some of the blue cast. There's lots of other ways to do it. You can, in Adobe Camera Raw, you can choose an adjustment brush and you can actually set a white balance adjustment to be warm, and then you can paint it in over your area that's got that bluish cast. Um, it also works the other way. Sometimes you'll get yellow casts, or you'll get lamps that are really weird. Mismatched lighting causes that all the time. Um, so white balance, sometimes there is no one right answer, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, what you need to do is get it right, for the most part, on site. Um, but know that you can always edit anything troublesome in post um, to a certain degree as well. 
and um, sort of the selective tonal adjustments, that stuff I mentioned where you, you know, take a brush, that's pretty advanced. That's like right up there with masking. That's a bit weird. It's a bit of art history there. Um, okay, moving on. Next. How much time do we have? Am I doing all right? Okay, well, <laughs> I'm doing a lot of talking. Okay, number five, correcting lens distortion and vignetting. So every lens is designed to take something circular and stretch it out so that it's a rectangle. Okay, so when that happens, um, there are flaws in that process. So uh, I'll give you an example. The Nikon uh, 16 to 35 FX lens has horrendous barrel distortion. It is offensive. And what, what I mean by barrel distortion, just to define it, is any lines that appear, you can kind of see them in this image as it flip flops back and forth, on the edge of the frame will be curved. So I'll put it back. You can see it in the lamp. Can you see how the lamp um, sort of post thing here is curved? So if those lines are curved, that means that it will be almost impossible for you to do step two, which was correct your vertical lines because they're not they're not vertical, they're curved. So correcting lens distortion is, is really important for getting those really professional results that I mentioned later. Typically in a workflow, that's what you do. You'd correct the lens distortion first and then you'd go in and you'd you know um, transform your image so that your lines are perfect because you can't do it while they're curved, it's too hard. So the way you do this, or sorry, let me go back to um, sort of the vignetting part as well. So lens, lenses will typically have light fall off at the corners. So because you're taking this circular image and you're kind of chopping a rectangle out of it, that means that if you were to sort of zoom out, what you would see is that it's actually a circle. There's an image circle. And that circle is overlaid on top of a rectangular sensor. And at the corners, you're getting very, very close to the edge of that circle where the light begins to fall off. So that's why you have what's called vignetting, which is where the corners are kind of dark. So you can kind of see it here in the, in the bottom, in the top left-hand corner of this image. In order to remove this, um, you can do it manually in post. You can do it uh, like by just you know using Photoshop or Lightroom and choosing a setting. I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but it's like vignetting removal, and you can, you can use a slider. So a lot of cameras will remove it automatically um, right on site, or um, Photoshop or Lightroom or camera raw, it might have a profile that will automatically remove it as well. So typically they're they're you know you know right together in Photoshop or camera raw, and you would select your lens from a list. So this works great for name brand lenses. So if it's like a Nikon 14 to 24, no problem. It's like one checkbox, you're done. If it's a weirder lens, like a Rokinon 14 millimeter or something or other, you might have to do it manually. But once you've done it manually once, you can save that setting or just remember it in your brain. And then you can use it from then on. So it's really not a big issue, even with, um, you know, non-name brand lenses. But uh, typically, it's literally it's one checkbox. You just click it once, and it just goes bloop, and it and it fixes it for you. So um, I hope that's coming across uh, as a as a visual. Oh, you can also come back here and check it later, obviously. All right, next, I'm gonna have to move a little faster. I'm gonna run out of time. Color fringing. So color fringing is something that people don't think about, but it's really really ugly. So I don't know. If it's really all that visible, ah, here we go, okay. So color fringing occurs, it's, its official like name is spherochromatism, and it's really um, purple lines around stuff and green lines around stuff. So the purple ones are the most heinous because they're so obvious. But what's gonna happen is that even if you're using an ultra wide angle lens, you're gonna have um, what is essentially a focal plane. So somewhere, somewhere in there, might be hard to find, but there will be a place where everything is perfectly in focus and everything in front of or behind that will not be as in focus. And anything outside of that focal plane is gonna be subject to this fringing. It has something to do with the way light waves work. You'll have to look it up. Uh, but what it means to you is ugly looking weird purpley and green stuff in your images, which is really annoying. But you can remove it really, really easily. Uh, it's the same thing. Cameras will automatically remove it sometimes, not a setting. Or in Photoshop, it's one, one checkbox. Just click it and it will remove it all for you. This is one of those things, I haven't gone into this yet, but this is one of those things that um, people will not immediately understand, but see um, as ugly intuitively. So um, there are lots of things like that, and quite a few of them are on this list. So um, I, the first thing I mentioned, making sure your images are perfectly level, and making sure your horizon line is level, that's not something that a client might immediately pick up on. They might look at the image and go, oh, cool, look, I can see the furniture, and I can see, you know, I can see the cabinet looks really nice. They might not immediately notice that it's slightly crooked, but it, it will bother them, even if they can't articulate it. And this is one of those things as well. So even though they don't know what this is called, 
they'll, they'll know it's icky and they won't necessarily like your images, but they won't be able to tell you why. So that's why it's very frustrating. Sometimes they'll think of something else and say, I don't know, maybe it's too dark, maybe it's too, I'm not sure what's going on, but something's not right here. So if you fix it, you don't have to worry about that. All right, moving on. <laughs> choose your angles carefully. Okay, so that we could talk all day about sort of what to choose. I'm gonna give you some basic guidelines for framing your shots. It's really, really basic. Uh, number one, don't cut things off. So you can see in this image here, I haven't chopped off any furniture. It's just, everything's included in the image, it's just there. There are times where you can't do that. You're gonna have to chop things up and um, you're gonna have to be artistic about it. <laughs> so that's all I can really say there. Um, what I mean by that is it's sort of like most of the time you wanna avoid chopping things, but occasionally if you have to do it, uh, just pick the best spot you can um, and it's fine. Um, my recommendation, especially when you first start, is choose angles that look like this. So I mentioned this briefly earlier about shooting um, walls straight on. So yes, you can get perfect vertical lines, and yes, you can do perfect horizontal lines. But often having perfect horizontal lines is way more trouble than it's worth, and it doesn't actually create that more um, a more compelling image. It can break things up though, which is kind of cool. So look at this image. You can see that the lines where the walls intersect the ceiling are coming in at angles and they're they're leading in to that intersection between the two walls in the back. So we're shooting into a corner. So if you're new to real estate, always shoot into corners. It's way easier. So what happens is that you don't have to worry about horizontal lines because they're clearly not going to be horizontal. And the vertical lines um, are still a concern. You still have to worry about those. Uh, but those lines, those those leading lines draw you into the photo. Like it feels like you're kind of being pulled in. So it just works. Like it's very compelling. If you try to shoot straight on, and get your horizontal lines to be perfect, you're gonna run into that scenario where something's a little bit off and people don't understand why. So let's suppose that you shoot straight onto that wall and you're, you know, the intersection between the wall and the ceiling is not perfect, it's like one degree off. That's not something someone can articulate. They're gonna look at that image and go, well, oh, I don't know, something's not right about this. So again, something to avoid, don't even bother. When you get really confident and you're willing to put in the time and effort, uh, then you can try to tackle that. So what I mean by time and effort is that in order to get that shot perfect, you're gonna have to square your camera to the wall perfectly so that the sensor in the camera is you know, exactly um, you know, parallel, if you will, to the wall. That's like impossible to do, especially when you're looking through a viewfinder or even on the screen on your camera. It's very, very challenging to do on site. So that means you'll have to do it in post. And you can do something called the horizontal transform tool in post. But the horizontal transform tool is very challenging to use while simultaneously using the vertical transform tool. So it's almost just way more effort than it's worth. You could spend 20 minutes just editing one image and it's not worth it at that point. I won't get into timing today, how long you know you should take to shoot or post process, but that is there is a discussion there that we probably could have at some point. Um, what else did I put here? Leading lines got to that. Shooting this way makes it easier. Oh yeah, okay, so shooting with a wide angle lens. So this, I should have mentioned this right off the get-go. You need the right tools um, to do real estate photography. So in the event, a fortunate event that you don't have one of these, um, you need an ultra wide angle lens. So on full frame, that's 14 to 16 millimeters. On crop sensors, that's like 10 to, I don't know, 12, I guess. Um, and there's a good reason for that. So it's not to make rooms look bigger, although it does do that. <laughs> it's to make your job easier. So when you're communicating a space, typically you're taking images to show a space um, and to um, I, you know, show features, to visually show things. So if you can't show as much in one image, you need to take more pictures. So if you have an ultra wide angle lens, you just need to take less photos. Also, bonus, if you have the property documented in fewer photos, it's a much like tighter experience in terms of like a tour. Like people can look at the photos and get the information they need from one photo instead of looking at three or four um, and having a lot of similar photos of the same space. So typically you're gonna use the widest lens you can get your hands on. Um, and then my recommendation would be to, um, not to fuss over it too much when you're shooting, but to back up into a corner, shoot to the opposite corner, uh, try to gather as much image data as you can, make sure your camera is perfectly level, and then um, crop after the fact. So a lot of people don't like that, they don't want to post-process, um, but cropping in post can get you way better results than spending forever on site trying to line things up. But if you prefer to do it on site, as in line up your camera to have the perfect shot, go ahead, that's fine. Um, 
you know, different strokes for different folks. Oh, there you go. So I, I just, uh, I was just ahead of myself there. So a standard lens would be something like a 50 millimeter lens, we'll say. And that's just not going to cut it. Um, if you are new to real estate photography and you have a lens like a really popular one is a 24 to 70 lens, kind of general all purpose lens, you might think, ah, 24 uh, millimeters is totally wide enough. Okay, it's not, it's not even close. If you try to use a 24 millimeter lens on a real estate shoot, you're gonna make your life miserable. <laughs> so don't even bother. You know, don't sell that lens. It's an awesome lens probably, it'll cost you a fortune, but it won't work for real estate or it might work for a very brief period of time, um, you know, to get you through, but you really need to upgrade to something wider at some point. And um, the benefits of doing that are that you're creating like obviously you're saving yourself a lot of time and energy because you don't need as many photos um and it opens up a lot of compositional freedom because you can choose to you know recompose later when you crop and it really creates something that looks like it belongs in a real estate listing so everyone else is using wide angle lenses so as soon as you switch to something that's not quite as wide people say oh i don't know about that that doesn't look quite right so it's another one of those sort of weird intuitive things that people pick up on oh here's a good one yeah make sure to have your images be focused so um the uh here fun fact for you so i shot this house it was in hamilton actually i could have ridden my bike over to, it was so close to my house um i shot the entire basement with one pano because it was so small <laughs> this is like a 500 square foot house it's awesome you can see this kitchen's pretty tight anyway um having your images be in focus is a big deal because um if they're not in focus or they're not perfectly in focus um that's one of those things that people they'll pick up on it they'll say hey this is blurry what's going on or they won't immediately notice on something like a mobile screen, but then they'll load it up later and be horrified when they bring it up on their computer. So I'm gonna give you some tricks for keeping things in focus. I would recommend that when you're shooting, you keep your camera at a high f-stop, so eight to 16, somewhere in that zone. It kind of depends on whether you're on full frame or crop sensor, but f8 is very safe on both, it's fine. f8 to f11 in that zone is totally safe for either. Um, that way your photos will be nice and sharp because the depth of field will be very, very deep. So a lot of stuff will be in focus at that. And compare that to something like f2.8 where whatever you've chosen to focus on will be in focus and things in front of or behind that will be out of focus so f8 that's my recommendation more or less and set your camera to what's known as focus priority so this setting is really annoying <laughs> so what it means is that you set your camera so that when you press the shutter button it will only shoot if it thinks it's in focus so the reason that's annoying is that you want to shoot but it won't let you and that's frustrating, but it's a good thing, it's very safe. So another problem with digital photography is that it's hard to tell what you've got when you're out shooting. Even if you have your camera configured to, to zoom in, to check for critical focus, what you'll find is that you still might miss something. So if you set your camera to focus priority, it gives you one extra layer of protection so that you don't accidentally get home and find out that you have a whole bunch of photo, photos that are out of focus. So I shot, I don't know, like two or three houses in a row one time with my camera's lens set to manual focus, and I had no idea. Um, and I didn't have focus priority and it just kept shooting, right? And I can't tell on the view screen of the camera that it's out of focus. Now, luckily, because the, you know, um, depth of field is so deep on a wide angle lens, it didn't really matter. Um, but they weren't as sharp as they could have been. And that limits your ability to crop in or to do post-process. So, um, setting your camera to focus priority is a good idea. When you, I forget what it's called for Canon. I think Nikon is called focus priority. I also don't know what it's called for Sony. Um, but there's a lot of other things you can do to make sure your images are very, very crisp. And what this does is this maximizes, this is all about maximizing the resolution of your camera as well. So it's more about, or it's, it's about focusing, but it's also about, um, sort of best practices. So I'm going to run you through a few of them. Always shoot on a tripod. It may be very tempting to shoot handheld, never do it. Always on a tripod. Um, set your camera to focus priority so that it won't, you know, shoot if it's not in focus and set something called a camera or exposure delay. So what that means is if you press a shutter button, it takes a couple seconds before it shoots. So every time you touch your camera, it wiggles a little bit. So if you just grab your camera and push the shutter button, there's a little bit of movement there, and that, that's enough to blur your images. So if you set to exposure delay, you push the button, and then after two seconds, it'll then shoot. And this is really fun. It gives you the opportunity to realize that you're standing in front of a mirror and dive out of the way, um, which is always funny in front of a homeowner or whatever. Um, and then the last thing would be single point autofocus. So there are lots of different ways to approach this, so I'll tell you mine. My recommendation is that you set your camera to single point and that you manually choose 
what the camera focuses on. This is um, really useful for things like portrait photography and for really anything where you need to choose exactly what should be in focus. And the reason that you might want to do that before I tell you how to do it is that um, if you let the camera decide what's in focus, you just put it on auto or whatever, it might choose the wrong thing. So if you're in a bathroom or a tight space, it might fo it might choose to focus on the like bath towel hanging next to the you know the lens. And if that's the case, then everything off in the distance might be out of focus. Um, and you don't really you might not be able to tell again, but it won't it'll pass the focus priority check because it thinks it's in focus because it chose something that was close and it is indeed in focus, but everything else isn't. So it chose what the priority was. So when you're when you're um, when you're shooting and you set your camera to single point autofocus, what that means is you use the little direction pad on the back of your camera and you look at the viewfinder through the viewfinder and there will be these little dots and you move the dot onto something in the you know through the viewfinder onto whatever it is that you want to focus on off in the distance. So let's suppose it's a pillow. Perfect. You know the pillow will have a pattern on it. The camera will be able to focus no problem. If you have something like a blank wall, you need to find a detail on that wall to focus on. Cameras are really good at focusing on things with a high contrast, you know, a sharp difference between light and dark, and they're terrible at focusing on things that are neutral. So this will not work if you're trying to focus on just like a beige wall. I don't know why you would want to be focusing on a beige wall, but <laughs> you could. But the goal here is that when you're choosing what to focus on, you pick something with details, and then you can be very confident that the camera will have shot uh, what it is you want in focus. Um, and it won't have accidentally focused on something else. Okay, I think this is the last thing, right? Number 10, yeah, okay, last thing, good composition. So good composition is all about <laughs> storytelling. So when you're shooting images, it's a good idea to think about what it is you are trying to communicate with that image. And the reason is that forces you to make images that have a purpose. So every image should have a purpose. And if it doesn't have a purpose, then why are you taking it? So the story that it tells is almost always going to be like, what would it be like to be in this space in the terms of real estate, right? The story is not really complicated. Um, but when you think about it in that way, it's helpful. So if I shoot an image, you know, sort of at a living room, I want to give a viewer the impression of what it would be like to be in that space. So I'm not going to shoot it. I'm not going to shoot like, you know, looking at just the couch. I'm not going to shoot looking at the fireplace. I'm going to shoot as though I were looking in on that space and I, I could step into the photo and be in that space. So I'll give you a, a, a few good examples and some bad examples. So a uh, good example, um, shooting from a corner into a space showing the whole room. Great. Um, another good example would be, um, you know, sort of showing, uh, shooting one image, showing several spaces at once, you know, so you've got an open concept space. You really want to show the dining, the living room, and the kitchen all in one go. That's cool. I love that. Um, trying to show something like an area, you know, that's meant for a purpose. So, um, you know, like a study area. You know, it's not it's not its own room, but it's like it's a unique purpose. You're like, okay, I'm going to shoot that. So you, you frame up the, you know, a little reading nook maybe with a desk. Or something. Um, typically, rooms are going to be pretty obvious. Like a bedroom, well, it's a bed. You've got a wall, and you've got a bed, and you've got a dresser, and you've got a um, a window or whatever, but you're gonna you know have to like be a little more creative when spaces are open concept and they're kind of broken up. But there are lots of bad examples of things you could do. So when you're shooting, you know, a room, it's very tempting to want to shoot multiple images of that room, but you have to think about why you would do that. So if you shoot one image, is that image enough? It may be. If the image is enough, don't shoot more. You don't need more. If you do shoot another image, what's the benefit? of the new image over the last image. So often you'll find something. So um, typically you're gonna shoot you know, from one direction to show sort of like what it would be in the sitting area, and then you'll shoot from another direction to show what it would be like looking in you know, towards you know, the sitting area, but then with the dining room in the background, like you're trying to show different perspectives, and that's fine. Um, the, uh, so I'll give you like sort of a famous, um, two, two really bad examples of things not to do. <laughs> you'll have to use your own wits to figure out the rest, but there's two good examples. One is taking a photo of a toilet. So when you're shooting in bathrooms, never point the camera directly at the toilet, always the vanity. If you point it at the toilet, the story that you're telling is that this room is for pooping, which is funny and true, but also um, horrific. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Always the vanity. Toilet is irrelevant, or even a shower in some cases. Sometimes they're fancy. 
The other one that's really funny is when people point the camera down the stairs and they shoot a photo. Like, what's the story that that's telling? This is what it would look like if you fell down the stairs. I always get a kick out of that one. I see it online. Um, as far as these, uh, all these rules go, just to bring it to a close before I answer some questions. All of these are, are they're not hard rules, they're guidelines. You know, you can break these rules if you know how. So you don't have to do these things. But if you start by following all these rules, you're going to make your, your real estate photography significantly more valuable to your clients. They may not really understand why, but um, it, it will be of more value to them and be far more professional and be more marketable. So I'm going to give you one example of where you could, in theory, once you get good, kind of break the rules. So that's with vertical lines. So if you are standing on a princess balcony and you're looking down at a you know living room, or you know, you're on the second floor and there's like a railing or whatever. Well, there's no way you can do a shot shooting down where the vertical lines are straight. And that's okay. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's a cool shot, you know? Um, likewise, if you're in a, a heavily urban area, like you guys are from all over the place, so who knows? You might be from uh, downtown Toronto. Sometimes the house is like, you know, five feet from the road. So there's no way you're going to be getting corrected verticals. You basically have to point the camera up um, in order to see, you know, the house at all. So in that case, yep, yeah, you can correct it a little bit, but for the most part, you're going to have those converging verticals at the top, and that's fine. Um, but if, like I said, if you follow these rules in a general sense, you will um, not only make your uh, real estate photography more valuable, you'll get far fewer complaints, which means that um, you'll get, you know, more work done. You'll get more referrals. Um, your life in general will be just so much better. <laughs> All right, cool. So now I'm going to answer questions. How much time do we have left? Ah, 10 minutes for questions. That's not too bad. Okay, cool. Let's see what we got. Uh, so I already answered that. Yes, you can use the level on the IMS5. Yep. Uh, Photoshop editing. Yeah, I'll do a whole uh, thing on Photoshop. Um, I can show you how to do all of these things. I can also show masking. Um, Lightroom and Photoshop basically are under the hood nearly identical. So I typically use what's called, uh, I use Adobe Camera Raw plugin for Photoshop, and it is nearly identical to Lightroom. Most of the things that you're doing um, in Lightroom or Camera Raw are really sort of like about, you know, sort of creating um, the images using the data that you already have. Photoshop is more about, you know, creating things sort of after the image is already done, you know, sort of doing weirder stuff. But that being said, Photoshop can do some serious heavy lifting that is amazing. <laughs> I'm more familiar with Camera Raw than I was for than I am for Photoshop. I shot uh, for many years using Camera Raw uh, before I knew. Sorry, before I knew that Lightroom was a thing. So I just got used to it. But really, they're the same thing. Um, yeah, so I'll totally do that. Uh, question about IMS five. Oh, yeah, okay. So I can answer that question. So you can use the IMS5 camera to shoot still images. So if, here, I'll just show you, actually. If you go to goaguy.com. Sorry, I just sneezed. Um, you go to the gallery, and then you go here to residential, and you scroll down all of these properties in this list. I took all of the images. Oops, sorry, not that one these ones. I took all the images for these properties uh, with the iGUIDE camera. So all of these images, picking a wobble load, sorry, were all done with the iGUIDE camera. It's really good. It does great work. Um, the way that you get those images is through Stitch. You don't need any separate defishing software. Technically, you can do that, but um, honestly, it's way more work than it's worth. If you go into Stitch and you click on the button at the top that looks like a camera, that's the Take Snapshots button. If you click it, you can load up any panorama you want, and you can pull still images from that panorama. But the way you get a still out of a 360 um, is you have to click and like basically compose it. You know, you have to sort of tell it what you want. But uh, the rules still apply. It doesn't automatically make good photos. You have to use all the same rules that I just mentioned in that blog post in order to get um, photos that are good. So basically, it's doing the defishing for you. Um, all the snapshots are saved right on your computer. You have access to them immediately, um, and you can take as many as you want. It's awesome. Uh, I struggle getting white balance set properly. 
what Adobe Color Profile is best? Is there a plugin that's better to fix white balance? Nope. All right, so I'm going to tell you what to do for white balance. So um, get good at um, basically setting the white balance um, using the eyedropper tool. That's my recommendation. So when you set the white balance using eye, so color space doesn't matter. It doesn't have any effect to any great degree on um, what colors you see. For the most part, no one on planet Earth is using calibrated displays anyway. So color spaces, they're relevant, but it's not, that's not going to affect white balance um, that much. My recommendation is that when you load up images into your post-processing software, you use that eyedropper tool and you, you play around with it. It's a dynamic tool. Both Camera Raw and Lightroom are non-destructive, which just means you can do all the changes you want, you can undo them. So you can use that eyedropper tool and you can click on stuff um, and you can actually see um, the difference as you click. So if you click on, on something, so for example, I, I mentioned earlier, you click on something that's white, say, hey, software, this is white. If you click on a towel and then the results aren't what you like, just click on something else. So you can experimentally sort of use the eyedropper tool wherever you want. Um, and you would see basically um, the changes and you could just pick one that you're like, uh, that you really you know, think is the best. When you have differing white balances, my recommendation for that, once you wanna tackle that, is to uh, use that desaturating the blue technique and then get good at actually adjusting the white balance in select areas. So that's gonna be adjustment brushes. So I can't describe that in its entirety now because it's really more of an artistic thing. You have to kind of show it. But I'll, if I do a Photoshop um, webinar, I guess not if, I will do a Photoshop webinar slash Lightroom and I will show you that. What is the typical number of photos you would offer with say a 2000 square foot house? You don't want to go overboard. That is an excellent question, Brent. Um, I just wrote a blog post about how many photos you should do <laughs> and uh, it will be posted badly. Today or tomorrow? So that's a great question because it's an easy answer, but I'll just tell you. So I, my recommendation officially is around 30. That seems to keep you out of trouble. If you give your client too many, you set their expectation that in the future you'll keep doing that and you won't, you're gonna dial it back at some point. So if when you first start, try to keep it reasonable. Um, but you make the property very hard to deal with when you have too many photos, right? So if you send your agent 150 photos, that, that's like overwhelming for them, that's too much. They may load them all into the MLS and then they're very hard to navigate because you'll have like 20 of the kitchen. So don't waste your time there. Um, around 30 photos, I'll go through which those would be. But if you go less than 30, there's got to be a reason because you're, you're, you know, your client's paying you for something. So they want to have enough photos to say, okay, this you know, um, property has been properly documented. But if it's a condo and there's only like one bedroom, well, you're not going to get 30 photos out of it. Like what is there to, to take a picture of, right? So it's going to scale with the size of the property as well, right? So if the property's small, you have fewer. If the property's bigger, you have more. But in general, what I typically shoot is I'll shoot two or three front exterior photos. So the most important photo for every single listing is that one money shot, if you'll forgive the expression, of the front of the house that fills the entire frame. So you need that photo. If you don't have that, it's very difficult to list a property online because all the images are really small. So you need one that shows that, that house as big as it can be in the frame. So you just need one, but usually I take a couple variations just so the agents have something to play with. You know, have one straight on and one to the left and one to the right, something like that. Then I might, depending on if it's garbage day or not, if it's not, I might take a picture of the house on the side of the frame, kind of showing down the street, showing the neighborhood. Uh, then I might take a picture of the um, front door. Oh yeah, here's another hot tip. I don't know why, but agents, homeowners, they're obsessed with front doors. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but they think it's really important. I don't think buyers care, but Maybe they do, who knows? So, but if you take a, a photo so kind of showing the front porch and the front door, often they put a lot of work in there. You know, they put little vases of flowers and they make it look all nice. So if you shoot that, they, they uh, tend to like it. So I like to include one of those. Uh, then I'll go around the back of the house and I'll shoot one of the back of the property showing the house itself. And then I might show one of the yard. And if it has any features, I'll show those. So I'll take a picture of the, I don't know, pool or cabana or deck or whatever. So typical outside photos, like, you know, five or six, not that many. Then I'll go inside and I'll shoot essentially what is one photo per room and I'll double up on important spaces. So there's nothing wrong with shooting extra photos and then not submitting them. That's fine too. But just to make that make sense, I'll shoot like two for the living room, you know, two for the dining room, two for the kitchen. And for bedrooms, I'm just going to shoot one. Like there's not a lot of story to tell there. The exception would be the master bedroom. 
So often they'll it'll have like a, a connected ensuite or a closet system or whatever. So you know typically you'd shoot it kind of facing toward the bed and then you go on the other side and you shoot the opposite direction. It's, it's a bigger bedroom, it's a bigger space. Bigger spaces need more photos. Uh, but the interior again just one sort of photo or two photos per space. Um, and then I'll you know divide up larger spaces. So if it's a big open concept like the one you can see on screen here, you'll have to do multiple images even though it's obviously only one space. Um, drafting on Saturday, so next question, Monday to Friday, uh, drafting is normal. Wondering if drafting on Saturdays will become available. Uh, they do draft on Saturdays. <laughs> so if you submit your property um, on a Friday, it will be drafted on a Saturday. And it's probably what you meant, but just to clarify, they don't draft on Sundays. So that means if you submit it on a Saturday, you won't get it till a Monday. Um, and that may be possible going forward. I really don't know. Oh yeah, okay, uh, Kelly already clarified it, cool. Does the IMS-5 shoot in RAW? Nope, it does not. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that. Um, you get more dynamic range out of the JPEGs than you can in one RAW file or even multiple RAW files. Multiple are, well, I guess not more than multiple, but either way, the amount of data required to shoot 20 or 30 panels in a house in RAW would be mind-blowing. So it's just, it's not even feasible. Um, it, it, shooting in RAW increases everything. Data, storage requirements, uh, processing time, uh, work, uh, effort on your part. So um, although it technically can shoot raw, it doesn't make any sense uh, because there's really no benefit in the images themselves or in the, um, in the uh, um, sort of shooting of the um, sort of panoramas like in their, in their totality like in terms of all the data that you're capturing. The interesting thing about raw is that you have full control over white balance. So that would be cool, but the auto white balance in the IMS5 camera is so good that it doesn't even matter. So what the IMS5 camera does is it shoots three different, like when it's on auto, it shoots in three different directions at three different settings, and then it auto equalizes them. Like that's that's um, that's really really good and very convenient, and it creates really really nice looking images. So um, raw wouldn't be of great value. Uh, is there ever a need to use the card slot for the camera? Nope. You can put a card in there, but all it will do is remove the little message that says no card in camera. So if you I find that annoying, you can if you want. <laughs> Um, does the IMS-5 shoot bracketing? Yes, it does. So it shoots uh, middle, under, over, um, and the bracket settings are actually visible on screen. If you look in the top right-hand corner, it'll say minus 5 plus 2. So that means it shoots one with ex a minus 5 exposure value, a normal one, and then one that's a plus 2, which is plus 2 exposure value. All right, cool. We're, we're at the end. Um, if there's no more questions, they're going to call it there. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, that was awesome. I'm always flattered when people show up to these things. Um, I have several requests for you. Um, one is that you uh, like, share, and follow us on social media, and tag us when you post content. So if you post something on social media, tag us, tag I Guide, and we will share and we will, um, you know, like that content so that it gets uh, more exposure. Uh, the recording will be available on the website. Actually, I'll just show it to you real quick so that there's no question about where it will be found. So on goiguide.com, click media, wait for it to load, and then scroll down and you can see it says webinar. If you click webinar, all the webinars show up. A lot of me in here. So if you wanna see this webinar, it'll be up probably tomorrow, um, but there's lots of past ones. So if you missed those, uh, you know, go for it. Also, don't forget to um, explore the iGuide knowledge base. So there's a lot of information here, <laughs> you know what I mean, about the iGuide system, about marketing it. Um, oh, yeah, so Kelly just put the URL for, for this page right here. It's goiguide.com forward slash blog. Um, and there's lots of other blogs you can read as well. But the iGuide um, support desk or knowledge base um, is available to, to you to answer a lot of the questions that you may have. So you can go in there and you can search. Uh, for knowledge base articles and um, you can find tons and tons of useful information. It's fun to digest it sort of slowly over time and kind of layer the information on. Uh, and that's it for today. Thank you so much everybody. It was a pleasure. Have a great uh, great day. Have a great weekend.